please stay and hear me out if these four things sound good for you. Because when I design portfolios, I design them for these four goals. To make money in up markets, to make money in down markets, to make money in flat markets, and each portfolio should preserve capital, reducing risk. Okay, so far so good? It appears those sound good to all of us. No surprise there. And I think it's fair to say that every manager says they design portfolios for these same four things. So you might wonder, what makes me different? Well, for one, I have a verifiable track record published on my website showing that I have done as well or better than the Standard & Poor's 500 over the longer term since 2005. I'm proud of that. And of course, I have to also mention that past performance is no guarantee of future results. Since we're focused on past performance, consider this. Those are the odds of doing that over 14 years. Standard & Poor's put those odds at 1 in 100,000. And yet, 5-7% to 7 of managers have done it for 10 years. No financial advisors I know of have done it over 14 years. For those of us that have, we know it's not luck. And I don't plan on changing what has worked so well since 2005. But before I tell you what I do to achieve that and how I can help you, I'll tell you what I don't do. I de-emphasize buy and hold. It had its time but its time is over. It's a strategy financial advisors have used for decades. You buy the blue chips, the safest of the safe, so they say. These are, for the most part, the stocks that made up the Dow Jones 30. These are the companies, Woolworth, Union Carbide, Alcoa, Westinghouse, Sears, Goodyear, Johns Manville, Bethlehem Steel, Anaconda Copper, American Tobacco, all of these were part of the Dow Jones 30 in 1966, and all of them were considered to be the bluest of the blue chips, and all of them are either out of the Dow today or completely dissolved and bankrupt. But what about the new guys? These companies are considered today to be the safest of the safe investment-wise. Microsoft, Intel, Walmart, Apple, Cisco, Home Depot, Verizon. And not one of these even existed in 1966. Richard Foster of Yale did a study that discovered that companies that were part of the Standard & Poor's in 1920 had an average lifespan of 70 years. That was then, but this is now. He estimates that a company added to the Standard & Poor's 500 today will have a lifespan of only 15 years. That tells me two things. One, the obvious one. Buy and hold time has significantly shortened. It's time for a new strategy. And perhaps less obvious to some, it's increasingly important to figure out how to stay ahead of how fast things change in technology, demographics, and lifestyles. So I don't do long-term buy and hold. Some might say the opposite of buy and hold is being a short-term trader. I don't do that either. John Bogle, who started Vanguard Financing, said that in his 50 years of experience, he's never known, nor has he ever known of anyone who's known, a short-term trader who could beat the market over the long term. So we don't trade frequently, and we don't buy and hold. We're somewhere in between. We don't consider ourselves traders on a daily basis or even a monthly basis. And I also don't rely solely on diversification. However, there was a time there was safety and diversification. This is a quote that was first written in a Chinese novel during the Qing Dynasty. Since then, it's been attributed to John F. Kennedy and more recently to Warren Buffett. It says, a rising tide lifts all boats. That quote has been used because when the stock market's going up, it tends to carry along all company stocks, the good companies and the duds. But when the tide goes out and the market goes down, you get to see who is swimming naked. In other words, the duds stand out quite starkly. The weaknesses, which were not obvious when everything was rosy and the market was going up, those weaknesses suddenly become 
you might even say, embarrassingly apparent. So diversification for diversification's sake, I don't do it. I also don't follow the industry's need for some sort of scientific explanation. I understand it. It's human to want that. A big discovery that puts everything into perspective and makes us all better at creating wealth. Let's use the Higgs boson particle as an analogy. On July 4th, 2012, the Higgs boson particle, the so-called God particle, was identified in the Hadron Collider. This is a picture of the collider. In 1964, 48 years ago, Peter Higgs theorized that the Higgs boson particle existed, but it took until 2012 to prove it. When it was identified, it cemented something that was fundamental to standard understanding of physics. It was nicknamed the God particle because if it had not been proven to exist, our entire understanding of physics over the last half century would have been invalid. We have similar discoveries in chemistry and biology. They provide us with consistency and give us the knowledge that we crave. They pay off our desire for understanding. So why shouldn't economics be the same? Why shouldn't science explain the stock market to us? Well, over the past two to four decades, the academics have built an explanation called modern portfolio theory, based on the rational market hypothesis. And when I say hypothesis, I mean it. The rational market hypothesis is still just a hypothesis. It has not been proven. But that has not kept it from being taught in almost all colleges and universities. Just as we teach the actual sciences of biology, chemistry, and physics. Because in the case of modern portfolio theory, it does not work. It would be great if it did, but it doesn't. It fails for a few reasons. It's based on incorrect statistical assumptions. Markets are actually irrational and inefficient. And the normal curve does not account for the outliers or the black swans that exist. So we don't get that scientific proof that pays off our desire to understand how the market works. In my opinion, and from my experience, I believe that's because investing is an art, not a science. If it was a science, he or she with the best computer would always win. All of this leaves us with only two ways to address what we seek to accomplish when we talk to anyone interested in having us manage their money. Our track record, followed by the oft-repeated disclaimer that past performance does not guarantee future results. That's all we've got. And it's a bit discouraging to admit it, just as it's discouraging for a prospective client to hear. Imagine if an Olympic athlete kept saying it before every race. Or if lovers said it to each other before making love. It just leads anyone who hears it to a feeling of uncertainty. Now make no mistake, we're legally bound to say it and to reinforce it. But it does illustrate a problem. Okay, let's talk about what I do do. Oh wait, one more thing I don't do. I don't make any money unless you do. After all, if I'm managing profit sharing accounts, I should share in the profits, not take a fee off the top. We do that because it puts Adam's financial concepts in it with you. We share the risk, so we share the profits. That seems like the only fair way to do it. But I get it. It's something very few financial advisors do. Of course, some of you might say that there are hedge funds that share profits, and that's true. But they also charge a 2% management fee, and a few charge 1%, even if the account goes down in value. There's still a fee. I am not aware of anyone else who does not charge a management fee for profit-sharing accounts. What I set out to do for our clients is create wealth, and I've been doing that for 32 years. We do our own research, build in long-only client portfolios. We have, like I already mentioned, over the longer term, done better than the S&P 500 as evidenced by the composite of our clients since 2005. This is actual performance. Actual performance, net of all fees. Of course, as you know, past performance is no guarantee of future results. One thing I can say is, our strategy to beat the S&P 500 is unusual because it includes conservative, moderate, and aggressive accounts. And the mix we choose is always customized to the objectives and risk tolerances of each of our clients who have stock accounts. 
Let's talk about profit sharing accounts. Profit sharing is a fairly new concept in individual accounts. In the past, hedge funds would set up limited partnerships where your money was commingled with everyone else's. It led to some abuses and we don't do it the way they did. Hedge funds don't talk about their techniques. You gave them your money, it went into a figurative black box. You would get quarterly reports, but you couldn't see what went on inside that box. We manage profit sharing accounts differently. This is your personal account. You can see it 24-7, what's going on. Completely transparent. You can see how much your account is worth at any time. We do manage two levels of accounts. We've had a long-only approach to managing smaller accounts, and you can qualify for that level with 100000 to invest. We call that a growth account offering. For our new profit-sharing offering, the minimum investment is $1 million dollars, with a net worth of 2.1 million, excluding house. Let's look at a typical equilibrium structure for profit sharing accounts. Long market stocks are bought with the expectation they will increase in value. Stocks sold short are shares borrowed and sold today with the expectation prices will drop and the shares borrowed can be replaced by the purchase of shares purchased at a lower price. So you and I make money on stocks falling in price. As we all know, markets go up and markets go down. So you get great net value. This design will lose money on the long stocks, but usually markets go down faster than they go up. Rather than riding through the down markets, the portfolio anticipates stocks shorted will partially offset the drop. We have a short track record here since it's a new offering, but so far the results are very good. New clients often ask, what makes this different? Well, here's something I believe, and my results have shown. The performance and capital preservation are not mutually exclusive. With the proper structure, accounts can achieve performance exceeding the S&P 500 while maintaining capital preservation. Higher performance does not necessarily mean higher risk. Experience and research have shown me that the two, managed correctly, can complement each other. And here's where I run afoul of robo-advisors. They will give you performance or capital appreciation, but not both. True, they're less costly than human financial advisors, but not much better. Because in fact, most humans who work at big brokerage or RIAs share that with robo-advisors. They'll give you one or the other, but not both. And that leaves the few of us who specialize here. We deliver capital preservation and higher performance. Yes, we're the most expensive, but you get what you pay for. If I hit it out of the park for you repeatedly, that's worth more. Noting again that if you make nothing, I make nothing. So I think of it this way. Don't pay a 240 hitter, but you pay a 325 hitter. And let's stay with that baseball analogy for a moment. If we're managing your money, you should want a manager who's going to get you to the World Series, to keep winning for you, who keeps hitting the grand slam of capital preservation and higher performance over the longer term. If your manager doesn't deliver the wins, do what they do in baseball. Fire your manager. Instead, historically, that's not what investors do. When I started managing client portfolios, everyone was charging 3% for the first 250000 or 500000 and most advisors delivered poor results. Big brokerage firms don't allow their advisors to track or publish their results, so it's hard to know how they did. But I believe these firms know how poorly their advisors did. How could they not? But the advisors thought they were doing just fine, or better. When Jackson National Life surveyed them in 2012, they found 75% of financial advisors felt they outperformed the market. But Cerulean Associates did a study of how advisors actually did over 2010 and 2011. And here's what they found. While the Standard & Poor's 500 was up 17%, financial advisors averaged 4%. By the way, during that time, Adams Financial was up 26%. While the financial advisors were feeling they were outperforming the market, we actually were. Remember, Past performance is no guarantee of future results. So as most advisors underperformed, their clients pressured them to drop their fees, and down went the fees. Average fees are around 1.5% for accounts of 500,000, 
and there's pressure to push those fees down even further. That probably also explains why the big companies have a mantra of sell the relationship and not the performance. Back to baseball. Don't push down fees, bring in a new manager. You never hear of a baseball team that loses year after year simply pressuring the manager to take a lower salary. They fire them and replace them with someone who can get it done. I'd love the opportunity to talk to you more about how I can get it done for you.